presenting uh, results of some modeling that we requested, but I'm not a modeler, so I'll be reading parts of this to make sure I say it right. Uh, but I think this has some exciting management implications beyond brown whitefish, so I'm just going to kind of run you through uh, the rationale and what we asked them to do and what the results were. So we'll talk a little bit about brown whitefish. Um, they live in cold, deep lakes, very cold streams. They live in excess of 10 years and mature, roughly around age three to four, depending on the latitude. Uh, DC has some data that shows possible reproduction as early as age two in some of our populations that we've stopped. Um, they do have a circumpolar distribution, so while this species is listed, um, you know, as endangered, it oops, touch bad. Uh, while the species is listed as endangered in New York, they're by no means um, scarce in other parts of the world. Uh, and they're, but they are gone from the New York side of Lake Ontario, and they're deeply imperiled in the Adirondacks. So how did we get to this point? <coughs> so uh, go back, jump in the Wayback Machine and look at 1869. This is an excerpt from the report of the superintendent of the Adirondack Fish Hatchery. <laughs> Uh, regarding the egg takes that year. So the next time Matt Jackson complains about reporting, this could be you. Um, <coughs> so at this time in the 18, 1860s, our friend the rare whitefish, uh, otherwise known as the frost fish, is characterized as super abundant. Uh, the state hatcheries extensively stocked them, from, stocked them throughout the state from the 1860s until about World War I. Um, and New York State records show that 75 million round white fish were stocked between 1895 and 1918. We put these buddies everywhere. <coughs> so, um, so what happened, right? So these are some pictures just to illustrate some of the problems. Beginning in the 1860s, state fish managers and private interests began stocking fish species outside of their native range across the state. Uh, many of these were incompatible with the fragile fish communities of the Adirondacks. We also had extensive forestry and mining in the Adirondacks that significantly altered the landscape and waterways, uh, destroyed the habitat, polluted the waters. So I just want to point out that um, all of these pictures are actually of the Adirondacks. So on the left, we have you know, a typical illustration used you know, when we talk about acid rain. Um, this is a picture from the ironically named Honest Fisherman's Club. Um, it's labeled as being from the Adirondacks in about the 1880s. And if we zoomed in on that, if you looked at some of the species, we already had northern pike, we have uh, bowfin, we have lots and lots of bass, all kinds of things that you don't see typically associated with, uh, you know, oligotrophic, cold, high altitude Adirondack ponds. And for those of you that don't know, being here today, this is the Adirondacks in that period as well. It was heavily, extensively logged. Um, there were active mines. So, um, you know, we had all of this massive habitat alteration, ecological alteration, and then by the time acid rain really started ramping up by the 80s and 90s, there were hundreds of lakes that were too acidic or too toxic with lumen to support fish in general. And brown white fish tend to have a, a pretty uh, narrow range of pH. They, they need to have a pH of at least 6.5 to reproduce. So we have an awful lot of uh, factors working against us to this fish. <coughs> so this is a, a clip of the, the species range map from the New York uh, Fish Atlas that Doug Carlson and, and Bob Daniels produced, uh, along with Jeremy Wright. And the gray dots depict the former known range of brown white fish from the Adirondacks. So uh, most of those gray dots are based on the biological surveys of the 20s and 30s. Um, and even from, so the superabundant, we took you know, 20 million eggs. Um, by the time the 20s and 30s rolled around that baseline survey, um, the species was listed as rare in the Racket River watershed. It was extirpated from the Racket Lakes in the Champlain watershed, though it was still found in Chazy Lake and Mirror Lake at that point. It was not found in the St. Lawrence watershed at all, and it was only found in fourth and seven Fulton Lakes and Lime Kilian. So, <clears throat> these uh, fish were listed as New York State endangered in 1983, and by the year 2000, round white fish were only known to remain in six self sustaining populations, and those are shown by the yellow stars on the map. Um, so, we've been stocking them, trying to restore them. Um, so, they're present today um, in 12 those still in those six, and then 12 non-historic waters scattered around the Adirondacks. 
students are trying to put them wherever we can. The two green stars you can see up here. So we've got Evergreen Lake and Trout Pond um, were, were stocked and they have since shown natural reproduction, although they are non historic waters. Um, another uh, water, Fishbrook Pond, which is off the map down over here somewhere. Um, is expected to start demonstrate reproduction any time now. The fish are in really good condition. We've been co-stocking them with um, a rootstock for trout water. It's very remote. We fly them in. Nobody can get there to dump something stupid in it. Um, and we've also have demonstrated natural reproduction in Bug Lake over here since this map was drawn. <coughs> so, um, so the good news is that the acid levels up until a couple weeks ago with the changes to the rollbacks and the Clean Air Act stuff. So, uh, acid levels have been dropping around the Adirondacks, and so more waters are again potentially suitable for round weight fish if they don't have introduced species of them. <laughs> so all of this activity going on, why do we need a model? <clears throat> so if you're keeping score, we've stocked 17-ish uh, waters since 2000. Three of those have, have shown successful reproduction. So we've been spending an awful lot of time and effort, and in many cases these are very remote ponds that we are flying fish into at great expense and only three have, have kicked into natural reproduction. Uh, and then we have one more that looks very promising. Um, in the meantime, we have lost one of the historic waters and are in the process, apparent process, of potentially losing two or three more. So we are taking a step forward and maybe two steps back. Um, so sadly, this past summer, rainbow smelt were discovered in Newcomb Lake, one of those six extant uh, historic waters. And this likely spells the end of this population in the foreseeable future. Black bass and smelter in Little Moose Lake and uh, on the Lee Club property, and Cornell's doing a yeoman's job of trying to keep the bass under control and keep our round whitefish there. Uh, but it's an intensive electrofishing removal effort. Um, and since the recovery plan was written, the whole pond population has disappeared. And as you might imagine, one of our, our major uh, tools to accomplish all of this is using restoration or reclamation with rote note. Um, and a lot of lakes where they were historically found, um, Lake Placid, the mountain lake um, are all too big to effectively treat with rope milk. <clears throat> so we wanted to look for additional opportunities to retain the species within its historic range, but look outside of strict restoration of exact ponds. So in 2014, we looked to deep lakes with self-sustaining uh, lake trout populations. They're cold enough and round white fish use similar spawning habitat, so we thought that would be a good uh, surrogate, and we started looking outside the strict native uh, pond suite. But a second nagging question developed, and we wanted to know, how long are we gonna have to keep doing this? Our current bureau chief is a big fan of the question, when will we be done? <laughs> so we had a couple of goals when we went to the Natural Heritage Program in New York State, and we said, we want to increase the probability of reintroduction success by modeling all potentially suitable Brown whitefish ponds within the Adirondacks. So they looked within the blue line, but at every, every pond, not just his known historic waters. Um, and we wanted to better understand the effects of different rates around what, what, of different rates of pond reclamation on the overall round whitefish population in the Adirondacks. So uh, back in 2007, we had Jeff Steinhardt at Cornell University who did a fantastic analysis uh, for us that included a simple model that looked at all the waters in the Adirondacks with a known history of containing round whitefish and looking for the ones with a high probability of success. Um, you know, it was a very simple model that identified three likely factors, but because so many historic brown whitefish waters are unavailable for restoration at this point, um, usually due to the presence of an incompatible species and being too big to reclaim, we wanted to expand the search to all possible candidates. And the recent history of brown whitefish restoration seemed to indicate that ponds were continuing to be lost at a, great, at a rate equal to or greater than restorations. So we wanted an objective measure of effort and risk required to keep round fish on that landscape in New York, because that's our job as an agency, is to not lose stuff. <clears throat> Even though they're pretty common elsewhere. So we decided to start by modeling the suitable ponds. So we, I use that very loosely. <laughs> um, so they used a random forest model um, based on the characteristics of all current round fish ponds and lakes. So they, started with our base number of 18, where we have extant populations, some reproducing, some not. And the random forest model is a machine learning algorithm that compares the environment where a species is present to the environment of the set of background locations. This approach was found to be suitable for fish species in a 2002 study by Olden and Jackson, 
and the random forest model captures complex nonlinear patterns found in species distribution data. The model relies on characteristics from extant round white fish waters and weights the importance of each of the 18 lakes and ponds based on the population history of each one. The pond characteristics for the 18 occupied ponds were obtained from the 2007 Steinhardt Assessment and Recovery Plan. And just so Cliff knows, I still use that plan all the time. <laughs> it's a good investment. Um, weighting of occupied waters favored endemic ponds most heavily and stocked ponds with no prior history of round whitefish occupancy least heavily. Background points consisted of a set of 2,382 waters within the Adirondacks with no known history of round, uh, round whitefish presence. So, to better evaluate the ponds as potential candidates for round whitefish reintroductions, we used the species distribution model to identify physically suitable locations. Pond suitability was determined by measuring how similar a given water body was to ponds with existing round whitefish populations, with ponds more similar in habitat to ponds with existing populations considered the most suitable. The Northeast Lake and Pond Classification System ascribes over 300 environmental descriptors to Northeast Lakes and Ponds, and it was used as the base for the analysis. We refined these to 203 variables with, that had complete data for the Adirondacks. So it's a Northeast-wide data set of varying density uh, by location. So two, 203 of the variables were complete for uh, Adirondack Lakes. So the things, just a smattering, obviously it's 300 possible variables, variables, but some of the ones that they include are morphology, climate, dams, soils, trophic state, alkalinity, geology, landforms, land cover in the watershed, sort of all the usual suspects. <laughs> so the model yielded 70 lakes and ponds with either high or very high habitat suitability. The most influential environmental variables for describing round whitefish habitat included the combination of trophic, temperature, and alkalinity classes, the maximum depth of the water body, maximum air temperature, the soil texture group in a one kilometer buffer, and the proportion of impervious surface in a one kilometer buffer. So this is all good because it's kind of all intuitive. <coughs> there we go. So, um, so they used a random sample of 10 points from the background set and a random pull of 10 presence points of known populations. And they, they um, stratified it out by five of the poles were from the endemic ponds out of six. Uh, three from prior occupied stocked waters out of four. And two from no prior occupancy of stocked. Right, stocked ponds we did that had no history of prior occupancy. So they used the random forest uh, to associate round whitefish presence with the environmental variables. So as I said, we have a total of 70. Um, we had 30 ponds that's very highly suitable, and 39 is highly suitable. So and if you think about the native range, if you paid attention to the native range in the earlier slides, they all kind of cluster out over here in the native range of the fish. Kind of makes sense. So luckily, these designations correspond back to some of the ponds we already knew were good habitat, and either presently or historically supported brown white fish, and it gives us a wider array of, of ponds to investigate for restoration. Um, so obviously that's all gonna, as we've said, depend on the current fish community, the pH, and the size in terms of rec reclamation potential. Um, and if substrate sampling can be done, it could be an important factor as well to make sure that there is adequate spawning. The next part is long-term stability modeling. So we want to set a target number of waters, and we want to set an action schedule, and we're attempting to keep from dropping below the threshold of 10 ponds for recovery from endangered. So that's the recovery target in the plan. Um, so to better understand the optimal level of effort required by DEC to sustain around with whitefish within the Adirondacks over the next century, we simulated population dynamics under a variety of treatment scenarios, assuming we're going to have to keep, keep reclaiming stuff forever and ever, um, and compared the probability of complete extirpation. So, invasive species are a major factor in runway fish decline. We have this limited pool of possible candidates. Pond reclamation is a lot of work, and egg takes have been kind of unreliable because they like to spawn under ice. So, those are some of the working conditions that our hatchery staff go through, and our regional staff as well. <coughs> 
So, in order to figure all of this out, we built a Markov state model, again, we very loosely, <laughs> using data for records of 57 bond reclamations throughout the Adirondacks from 1989 to 2016. This is the really cool part. Most of these records related to reclamations for brook trout restoration. We used specific information on how long it took after the reclamation for a subsequent invasion to be detected. There are probabilities associated with each state change. The Markov model is similar in design to a population viability model with rates describing the likelihood of a pond transitioning from one state to another for each time step, but based on species presence rather than population size. The total number of ponds always remains the same. The probability of a pond transitioning between any two stages at a given time step is described by a set of rates. So rate one is the probability that a pond is treated that year. <coughs> We compared seven rates of treatment. Zero, meaning we abandon the program. One pond every 10 years, five years, four years, three years, two years, and one pond every year. Rate two is the probability that the treatment fails. It was fixed at 17% based on the observed frequency of treatment failures from the brook trout ponds. Rate three is the probability that a treated pond is stocked with brown whitefish, fixed at 100%, because if, if we reclaim it, we're gonna restock it. Um, rate four is the probability that a pond with round white fish will still have round white fish the next year, as in it won't get invaded. And the range of values was 1 to 0 0.7 based on observations of reclaimed brook trout ponds. Um, effectively, the rate is 1, rate 4 equals 1 over rate 5. And rate 5 is the probability that a pond with round white fish will be invaded by an incompatible species that year. The probability ranged from 0 to 0 0.3 based on observations of reclaimed brook trout ponds. So this is probably the first time in my AFS career I've actually put up a box. So, this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so we know from another notable difference from the standard population viability model is that the calculation of rate is the calculation of rate five. Um, so we know from monitoring the brook trout waters to date that the invasion of the Adirondacks is a stochastic process. So some waters were invaded after only two years, some not for twenty, some not at all. So to allow for the stochasticity of the simulation, the fate of each stage three pond was calculated individually using a random draw of zero or one, where the probability of a zero is, which is invasion, is drawn from the observed distribution of years to invasion seen in brook trout ponds. So we're basing this on actual data and then just taking random draws of what the rate might be, or the probability might be. So this approach allowed us to keep the fates of each round whitefish pond entirely separate from the others and to allow survival or extirpation of ponds to reflect both the variation and the stochasticity seen in the monitor data. So sometimes they were not invaded, sometimes they were. So the number of round whitefish populations after 100 years of each treatment scenario is what's depicted here. Box and whisker plots represent the distribution of values for the number of populations at year 100 for 1,000 runs. Values correspond to different starting number of populations and the horizontal line on the box plot indicates the median value for a thousand runs. <coughs> so, um, in order for us to avoid extirpation, we would be having to treat one pond every three years uh, to have a you know, reasonable certainty over a hundred years that they would still be there. And then to avoid that endangered threshold of 10 ponds, we'd have to be treating a pond every other year. So that's a pretty significant effort. And this is just to show you the flip side of that is the, the cumulative complete extirpation events over time. <clears throat> so the lines measure the proportion of 1,000 simulations which have experienced a complete extirpation event by each time step. So again, we want to have you know, a good reasonable probability of that persisting over time. So when we go back to our goals and the results, so the pool of physically suitable waters increased by 70 candidates based on modern data and our effort rates coupled with extinction risk if it's possible for the agency to evaluate our investment needs and benefits. So we have to figure out if we want to make that way. So I just want to acknowledge the people that did this, obviously the primary authors of the study who did all the statistics, not me. Um, and then Jim Daly and Doug Carlson and John Pierre and Tom Shanahan of DEC helped a lot with the uh, data collection and um, review. And obviously yeah. Jeff Steinhardt who provided a lot of the base information for the pond. So with that, thank you very much. Maybe one quick